Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's Friday, and it's the Daily Connection. So as you're coming in today, we are thrilled to have you join us. And this is going to be a little bit of a different day if you got to hear the music at the start. We are with Dr. Dan Diamond, and this is the first time we ever met. Dan, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Becky. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I just met you, but I feel like I know you. Ah, oh, wow. Yeah. Thanks. Well, we, d we did have some pretty deep conversation in that 15 minutes leading up to the start. I see that many of you are coming in. I want to invite you to find the chat as you always do. And we will be interacting in the chat throughout today. And we will just gently remind you, please use that drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees uh, so that we can see your responses. And I want to know who else today has some snow out their window. You want to take a look? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? No way. Uh, uh, yes, way, Dan. Snow in Michigan in April. Who else has some snow today? Let us know in the chat. Kitty, you have snow tonight in Rhode Island. It's good to see you again. And oh, it's raining snow in West Michigan, Jane. We're doing sun, sun, sunshine in Seattle. Really? Yeah, which it doesn't like, look put sunny. It on the calendar. And it's, that's not supposed to happen. Yeah, yes. So Dan, I know that you have a special prompt for our group today to get them engaged as we start. It's a different question than usual. So really quickly, quickly though, our friend John Saunders does have snow in Gurney, Illinois. Um, and Erica in North Carolina has 72 degrees and sunny. Can I visit, please? Yeah, come on. You just have to stay six feet away and wear a mask. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. So Dan, what's our question of the day? Yeah, the big question today is where in the last... In the seven to 10 days, have you seen humanity at its best? And it could be either at home or with your colleagues from work or uh, on TV or maybe even online. Where okay. have you seen humanity at its best? So take a moment um, and put that in the chat. And I was sharing a story with Dr. Dan before all of you joined about a client who called me on the phone just to check in to see how I was doing in a tough week, which was uh, definitely humanity showing up in a great way um, for me. So Dr. Dan, where have you seen humanity at its best while folks are typing? You know, one of the ones that really got me was in Australia, my friend said, hey, you're not gonna believe this. And she had this note that some kid had typed up and put a little sticker on and said, if you need any food or anything from the store and you can't get out, just text me on my phone and I'll go get it for you. I thought, oh, wow. If you'd gone around and putting them in all the mailboxes in their neighborhood, I thought that was absolutely fantastic. It was just cool. I love that. So here's a comment from Guy. He says, his housemates have been great, his wife, son, and pets, and very heartwarming stories in the media. Uh, Kitty likes that Some Good News show with John Kaczynski. Is that how you say it? Um, and Erica says online, oh, she's uh, shouting out. Yesterday, I posted on Facebook, my brother works for a manufacturing company that's based in Charlotte, Greensboro, North Carolina, and they were able to convert their operations to manufacture materials for masks and health workers. And Erica read it and then she shared it because um, we're we've all got, gotten to be pretty close. Dan, welcome to the group. <laughs> uh, Jane says 26 women from her church got together online Wednesday morning and it was great to see friends and everyone offered to help each other get things. We had, we had uh, a couple in our community that went around to all the distilleries and got them to produce alcohol and they created hand sanitizer for the homeless. That and is amazing. We made a lot of it. It was fantastic. We put it little bottles and took it out to them. and Because it's sometimes easy to forget them in the midst of it. So that was really cool. That is great. Well, keep sharing. Uh, I love this engagement this morning. And for those of you who love Twitter and want to tweet about today's topic, you can use the hashtag daily connection to live tweet uh, today's experience. So before we go any further, we have a poll for you today. Um, and it's a really important question. So just take a quick moment and give us your answer on this question. Do you want to have fun today? And Dan, it's a mystery, right? <laughs> what do you it, think? It is. You know, the, the bad thing is, it says the hosts and panelists can't vote. So what are you going to vote for, Dr. Dan? I'm voting yes, absolutely. You know, but it, there's this other side of me that people, a lot of people don't know, is that I used to be a street mime in Seattle. And that's how I made my money going through medical school. No kidding. Wow. I was, I was making a good 25 bucks an hour putting my hat out. So with makeup on? Hours. Oh, yeah. White in face. the rain, in the sleet? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So Erica says sarcastically that she wants to answer no. I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
show those results. It looks like 100% of the people who oh, answered good. our poll want right. to have fun today. Good. So fun that way. it sure is. Thanks, Erica, for not being sarcastic. Kelly, who's our chat host today, told me yesterday that when she wants to be snarky, but she thinks she's not allowed to be snarky, she'll say, well, if I were going to be snarky, I would say... <laughs> which is her way right. of being able to, being you know, snarky. say what, yeah, even when she looks like she's not being snarky. Um, Jane, that hashtag is daily connection. Okay, just to, just to prove this to you, hold, hold on, here we go. All right. There it is. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I put this picture on Facebook and I said, um, Box, invisible boxes for sale. Keep yourself fo uh, safe from COVID-19, eight bucks each. <laughs> and, and somebody busted my chops. They said, well, my neighbor's in quarantine. You're not funny at all. Oh, and I'm, I thought, I'm... well, you know, you don't know my world. Let me tell you a bit about my world. Um, if I don't use humor, I'm in trouble. All right. Well, I'm interested to see how you're going to incorporate some fun in today's topic because it is somewhat of a serious topic. We're going to be talking about how to have resilience in times of disaster. So, Dan, you've responded to lots of disasters around the globe. And maybe while you're answering this question, you can tell us about what some of them are and introduce yourself to us. Um, but I'm wondering what you've learned from those experiences that can help all of us during COVID-19. Yeah, I ran the medical triage unit at the New Orleans Convention Center after Hurricane Katrina, and I led first, team, first in teams into Haiti, the Philippines, Honduras. I've been to all kinds of crazy places. I've been doing this for like 35 years now. Uh, so, And each disaster has a little different personality and some different learning that comes with it. Uh, Katrina was, the, I, I try to come back and have one word for each disaster so I can kind of file it away and process the disaster. And, and Katrina was bizarre. I saw the weirdest stuff. Katrina was like a post-apocalyptic Mad Max and the Thunderdome experience. And I'm so glad that we're not doing that now and, and that we're getting along. If I was going to put one word on COVID-19, it would be kindness. Yeah, I mean, the, the politicians are fighting and being ridiculous, but those of us that are living in the real world are showing up and we're kind to each other. And it's just fantastic to see that. Uh, Haiti was devastating. It took me three or four months to recover. I cried coming back from that one. The Philippines had to have two words, tender mercy. Hmm. Because Say I more about like that. I, I felt like I was loved by a culture. And the reason is in the Philippines, and it's, it's radically different than any place else that I've been to um, for a disaster. In the Philippines, they're all about we instead of all about me. Mm -hmm. So a lot of places will run around and say, who's going to help me in, in the United States? When's FEMA going to help me? You know, in wherever, who's going to help me? Where are they going to help me? In the Philippines, as soon as the wind stops blowing, they go to their neighbor's house and say, hey, are you okay? Are your family members all okay? Um, we're cooking some rice come on over, we'll sit down and eat together and we'll figure out whose house we're going to rebuild first. Wow. And they went, I've got um, some video on my website from Tacloban in the Philippines that we shot from a helicopter that showed devastation that is mind-boggling. Like there was cargo ships that were tossed up on the beach and they would just squeegee all the homes off. It was a horrible situation. The devastation was mind-boggling. And now it's six years later, and not only have they rebuilt, it's better than it was before. And the mayor's office about nine months ago put out um, a video called Tacloban, the happiest people in the world. And I watched this video. You can search it on YouTube, um, Tacloban, the, the happiest people in the world. It made me weep. I watched, like I watched it five times. I cried every time. I said, how did you pull this off? Because so many areas that once they get hit by a disaster like that, they, they really have a hard time coming back. And um, this is a great example of what happens when we show up as we instead of me. That's a really powerful reminder, uh, Dr. Dan. And Kitty's saying she works for an international development organization that did a lot of work in Tacloban, and she's thanking you for your help there. Oh, you're welcome. Small it world. Was, it was an absolute privilege. Yeah, we, Kitty, take a look at my website. It's dandiamondmd.com. And if you click on media, you can go watch the video that I have from the heliclinics that we did. And then go look for Talk Loba on the happiest people in the world. And then let me know if you were able to watch the second one and not cry. 
<laughs> I, I will. I, I could maybe do that this afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Looks like Kelly's put your web address in the chat. So, um, and <laughs> Kitty says she cries at everything. So. <laughs> We're just going to try to get through this session right. today yeah. without crying, right, Dan? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you can cry if you want to. I feel like you. Uh, I don't know. Would rather not. Um, so tell me some lessons that we can apply uh, beyond the me, not we, that you gathered from those disaster experiences. You know, I, I came home from Katrina asking myself a question that changed my life. And the older I get, the more I realize that the conversations that I have in my head define the reality that I experience. And the conversations I have with other people define the culture that I experience. But I have to be really careful the questions that I ask. Um, for example, COVID-19. What the heck? Whose fault is it? Did the Chinese do this to us? Is the whole market? Why are they? Wah, 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 wah. I can go down, I can go down this, this hole. Um, or I can say, how can I best serve the people around me during this disaster? My brain reacts radically different to those two questions. In one, it consumes a massive amount of energy, and I just go, oh. In the other, if I start saying, how can I best serve the people around me? My brain goes, oh, oh, seriously, this isn't about you this time, huh? <laughs> That's awesome. I wonder what you could do. How could you help your neighbors? You got some neighbors that are elderly that are in by themselves, and um, what could you do so that they would experience uh, the sensation of being loved by their community? What would that look like? Those are better conversations. My, my brain just lights up. My energy level goes up. I start feeling better. The question that I asked myself after coming back from Katrina was not, why are there so many victims? We knew we were going to have a lot of victims. In fact, the media didn't tell you this but we had 50,000 body bags on pallets. We knew it was going to be bad. I didn't ask, why are there so many victims? Um, Anderson Cooper did, <laughs> and, and we had some interesting conversations while I was down there. Um, I asked, what is it about some of these people that they don't become victims? Because I want to be like those people, and I want to understand how they think, because I don't know what I would do if I lost my house, my clothes, family members, um, would I just sit on the curb uh, or lay down, face down in the ground, or, or would I be up and able to help other people and contribute and leave a legacy? So I wanted to understand how they think. And I remember watching an interview on CNN, and there was a woman holding her little daughter's hand saying, when is George Bush going to bring me my food? <laughs> screaming into the microphone. And I'm thinking, why would you think that George is going to? Because <laughs> I'm going, he's not. <laughs> George is busy right now. He's not going to come and bring you any food. Um, but Julian Rotter back in the 50s talked about this idea of locus of control, that some people have an external locus of control. The power is external to them, and stuff happens to them. Thrivers, on the other hand, have an internal locus of control and believe that nobody can ever take that away. Like Viktor Frankl, you know, he's an Austrian psychiatrist, spent seven years in the concentration camps during World War II. Uh, he said that nobody can take away our ability to choose how we're going to respond in any given situation. He described it as the last of human freedoms. So locus of control is part of it. So we could, let me draw this out for you. Oh, I love this. Dan is fancy with Zoom, folks. So we can go like this, and we could say at the top we have the powerful. The question is, will you be able to read my doctor chicken scratch here? But I can. How about everyone else? Yeah, and if you've got my picture small, just click the button in the right upper side, and you can make it bigger. Um, powerful and powerless. So... Some of the people show up in disasters and they say, I have the power to make a difference. And some people go, when is George Bush going to bring me my food? But there was more to that story. And I couldn't put my finger on what was bugging me, but there was another part. And it took me a couple of weeks of wrestling with this to realize what was really bugging me was that she was not saying, when is George Bush going to bring my daughter some food? She was saying, when is George Bush going to bring me my food? 
Because victims are powerless takers. It's all about them. And in fact, they start hoarding during disasters. Hence, we have no toilet paper and you have to use both sides of your toilet paper now. Just kidding. So we got the victim is the, is the powerless taker. Go like this. Give it a little color code going on here, trying to get fancy on you. If, if on the other side here we have the, the givers, it's just simple, powerful, powerless givers and takers. But the powerless givers are the bystanders. And they sit back and they say, well, somebody should do something for these poor people. Oh my gosh, look, somebody should do something. And it never occurs to them that it should be them. And sometimes, and by the way, these are not different types of people. These are different types of mindsets. And that's hugely important because if, I, if this is just a system for me to be able to label other people, then I have failed you. <laughs> This is a system for me to do in some internal work. This is for internal consumption. So sometimes I'll show up as the victim. In fact, if you asked my wife, she would tell you, that's my favorite go-to place when I'm under pressure. Nobody's taking care of me. I don't know. And I get all mopey. Or, honey, I really have a headache and I don't feel very good. And she'll say, oh, just go ahead and sit on the couch. I'll clean up the kitchen. I'm going, yes. It's all about me, and it's, uh, I don't have any power. I'm just going to sit over here and get other people to come and, and take care of me and, and, and rescue me. So the bystanders are sitting around going, well, somebody should do something, but it never occurs to them that it should be them. And then you have the controllers up here in the upper left. The controllers were people that were actually shooting at the rescue people during uh, New Orleans. And I'm looking at this in, in disasters. It's really easy to see human behavior and see it in its rawest form, and, and it's so obvious. You go, hmm, I wonder. If you're on top of a building and you're shooting at the people in the rescue boat, what do you think the chances are they're going to come back and get you next trip? Zero. <laughs> not going to happen. We're going to tag the building as, uh, as an active shooter, and we're not coming back. No way. You're going to die on top of your building. We're not coming back. And, and I thought, well, yeah, I would never do that. I would never shoot bullets at people. And, and that was all okay, and it was in my brain kind of all walled off for a long time. And then one day it got out, and it got out by a different question. Hey, Diamond, you ever shoot a look at your wife? I went, oh, dang. Yeah, I've done that. You ever shoot a comment at your kids because you were the one that was in charge, you were in power? Yeah, yeah, I've done that. You ever shoot an email at people that work for you because it was all about you and you got the power? Yeah, yeah, I've done that one too. And my, it's like, man, why would I do that? Because I know it doesn't work. Um, you know, and sometimes throughout my life, I've heard people say, if I don't look out for number one, who's going to? And I would say, if you look out for number one, who's going to? <laughs> really? So, like, if you step out in front of a bus, your whole team goes, no, no, no. Oh, it was such a nice bus. <laughs> but nobody will dive to save you when you're the controller. The thriver is the one that shows up and says, I have the power to make a difference, and it's not about me, and I don't care who gets the credit. That's a whole different mindset. If I come into a disaster zone and I have that attitude, I can get work done. So I have the power to make a difference. It's not about me, and I don't care who gets the credit. So if you take this, the powerful, and you take this, the giver, and you start thinking about what, what does that mean, the powerful giver? And you can translate that. And this gets kind of gutsy because nobody ever talks about this stuff in business, but I'm going to anyway. Um, you, could tra you can translate out the powerful giver as unstoppable. Love. Mm. 
And so my big question that I'm asking myself over and over and over again is what does unstoppable love look like right now? What does it look wow. like in your family? What does it look like in your business? It gets back to, I have the power to make a difference. It's not about me. I don't care who gets the credit. What does unstoppable love look like? You know, and I love the world of conscious capitalism because that at a macro scale is saying, um, how can we be the best for the world, not the best in the world? And how can we do great work to change the world? How can we be unstoppable and love the world? And, and I'm saying, how can we be unstoppable and love our team, love our organization, love our family? And here's an important one. What does unstoppable love look like towards myself? Because it's pretty easy to beat myself up during these high stress situations. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, even though I'm a disaster doc, <laughs> I've spent a couple of nights sitting on the edge of the bed at three o'clock in the morning going, ah, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then my, then I yell at myself quietly, you know, cause my wife is sleeping. <laughs> You're a disaster doc. Why would you do this, man? You know, you're going to get through this. You'll be okay. What's wrong with you? And then I have a better conversation and say, you know, self-compassion is about realizing, number one, that you're hurting, that you're anxious, um, and, and, and suffering, and recognizing that, and then showing up with kindness and saying, oh, man, I'm sorry you're hurting. You're sitting here on the edge of the bed. And then realizing that I'm not alone, that there's, you know, probably thousands of people sitting on the edge of their bed at the same time that I am, um, and, and that we're all in this together. But if I, if I don't start out by saying, what does unstoppable love look like towards myself or for myself? It makes it hard for me to show up for my team. But then, then I, when I'm loving myself, then I can show up in my team and say, um, hey, what's keeping you up at night? What can I do to help? Uh, I'm, I'm here for you. And I know that I know that I know that I can make a difference, even though all the rules have changed. Uh, and I want to lean in and, and take care of people without caring who gets the credit. And then you can take that to your team and say, hey, I wonder what we could do to make these other teams successful around here if, they, if we don't care who gets the credit. Mm -hmm. So what does unstoppable love look like now? Man, that is so powerful, Dan. And I'm wondering how you learn to show that unstoppable love to yourself. You know, I hear you say that and mentally I can track with you but in reality i find that to be really difficult yeah and you know for me and this gets into a really personal level but on a spiritual level i believe that god loves me like i am and then then the question is well if he loves me like i am why don't i love me like i am i am do i have different standards than he does really so it kind of starts that for me at a really really profound deep level um, but these are questions that i have to come back to over and over again I'd, I'd love to tell you, that, you know, that at 62, I've got this nailed. I, I, don't, I don't. I keep coming back to it over and over and over again during the day. What does unstoppable love look like? Yesterday, I got out of bed. And I got up early and I had big plans to exercise. And I sat there and I looked in the mirror and I went, dude, you are so tired. So tired. You should probably go back to bed. Really? Wouldn't that be good? <laughs> and then I said, what does unstoppable love look like? Oh, yeah, it's not about me right now. Unstoppable love, I'm going to brush my teeth, go down, get on my exercise bike, and get to work. So That's I was like, expecting the opposite. So was <laughs> the rest of my body. Yeah. Wow. Man, I, I didn't actually look at the prepared questions, Dan. We have about five <laughs> minutes left. And I know that this group is soaking in all the encouragement that you're pouring down. So what did we not talk about yet that you want to make sure we cover today? Oh, wow. You know, there's, um, there's so many things that we could talk about. I, you know, I think briefly, one of the things that I've found, um, just because I'm an old guy, and, and I so much wish that I would have been born smart and then got stupid. But um, because I was born stupid and I'm getting smarter, still going to school, by the way, 
Um, you know, how do you show up for people when they're hurting is a good question because we're going to, if we don't know somebody that's lost a family member yet, we're probably going to know somebody pretty soon. And also people that have lost jobs and there's all kinds of anguish going on right now. How do you show up? I've found that I, that there's three different ways that I show up. Number one, I avoid them. So I don't show up and I say to myself, well, they probably don't want me to interfere now. They probably, they need time to process this. Really what I'm saying is I don't want to experience the pain. I'm trying to protect myself. I'm going to stay away. And the result is there's going to be a gap in my relationship with them. I can still be friends with them, but there will always be a gap that can't be repaired, that they're going to say, well, you know, when I was hurting, you weren't there. The second way that I show up is with answers and think that I know what's best. And this is so hard as a doctor because I'm a professional problem solver. That's what I do. You tell me something I, and I say, oh my gosh, I know exactly what you need. Here's the answer. Uh, and, and, and it's superficial. And I, I'm just trying to make the pain go away for you and for me because I don't like it when you're hurting. And, and the result is sometimes I can offend you uh, or at, at the very best be irrelevant because I didn't connect with you. The third way that I can show up is to attend so I could be fully present. I love the word attend. It means to be fully present. If I show up and I attend, then my, my focus is not on the problem. My focus is on you, the person. It, what I end up experiencing is pain. Your pain is very uncomfortable. It's, it's tough. Um, but the result is I form a bond with you that will last for the rest of our lives because I was there. I don't need the answers. You know, back in the day before COVID-19, I would just say, hey, can I pull up a place on your couch? I'm just going to sit there. By the way, do you need a peanut butter sandwich? <laughs> I just don't want you to go through this by yourself. I have found an interesting thing. Last week, I figured this out. When you're on a Zoom meeting with somebody, you can connect at a very profound level when you realize that you don't need to talk. So on the phone, if you quit talking, people go, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? <laughs> on uh, on video, you can, you can say, right now I have something that I want to communicate to you that's really important. It's from my heart, but there aren't any words. So I'm just going to be quiet for a minute and share this with you. And it can be very, very profound. So, yeah, we're in interesting times. That's what I know. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, from what I'm seeing in the chat, this has been exceedingly helpful. Uh, Dan, I'm grateful to John Saunders who introduced us. I'm grateful to you to investing your time with us today. And I'm grateful for you, the people who keep showing up every day to learn and grow together. Um, I know that your words during this half hour and later on video as other people watch will make an impact. And I thank you, Dan, for the way that you're choosing to be a positive, okay, an unstoppable, a force of unstop, unstoppable love. I don't have any yeah, words, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and um, there's also the part about the fact that you're choosing to be a giver and make it about others. Yeah. So tremendous. Um, there's a lot of links. Um, Dan didn't mention that he does have a book called Beyond Resilience, and I can't remember the subtitle. Um, French-tested tools to thrive under pressure. Thank you, D Dr. Dan. Uh, you know, I would encourage you to, to check it out. And uh, Dr. Dan's working on a new book as well that sounds really interesting. So um, for those of you who are just meeting Dan for the first time as I am, I encourage you to find out more from him. And um, I hope everyone has a safe and healthy weekend. Next week, we'll be back with another five days of sessions. Wait, I take it back. Next week, we are only back for Monday. Uh, Thursday and Friday. Christy Kirk and I, my colleague, we're participating in a vir virtual book marketing event on Tuesday and Wednesday. So the Daily Connect is canceled on Tuesday and Wednesday, but we'll be back Monday, Thursday, Friday, and Monday. We have Randy Conley. He's from uh, Ken Blanchard Companies, and he's going to be talking about trust. Um, so I hope that you'll join us on Monday. And Dan, do you have any kind of parting summation yeah. for us oh, or yeah, music? Yeah, yeah. Or... Last thing I, wanted, yeah, yeah. I, was, I almost oh. forgot to say uh, yeah. that I'm doing these virtual workshops with organizations now and having a blast. It's so much fun. Not the talking head um, 
you know, that that's boring. Even though I'm a keynote speaker and that's what I do for a living, um, these virtual workshops are spectacular. We're uh, doing breakout rooms and facilitating some phenomenal conversations that uh, people have come out of these experiences saying, I feel connected. I feel like I have hope again. I feel like I'm, I'm back on the mission again. So, um, if, you know, if you have any interest in that, shoot me a note at dan at dandiamondmd.com. Be happy to explore that with you. And, um, and you know, we're working on a, a fee structure for these events that's uh, sensitive to the fact that people are, are struggling and some organizations are going through a tough time. So uh, don't let that um, keep you away from exploring it if that's something you think would be helpful. Thanks so much. Dan, you want to send us out with some cool music? Because I think oh, most of the yeah. people missed it at the beginning. Oh, yeah. The big question is, uh, will you dance when I play the music? Uh, me, no. Mm -mm. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I am not a dancer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Everybody have a terrific Friday. Hey, come on, come on, come on. Take the ride. There's a body over there.